Chapter 11 Witcher Roy woke up on a haystack one morning. After one long month of endless hunting, he finally saw the plus sign on the right side of his EXP bar. Level 1, 503-500. He finally managed to gain 500 EXP, and he had a pair of heavy dark circles under his eyes. Though he didn't manage to gain any ranged weapon skills, he was happy about the level up. Aside from that, his weaker stats saw an increase too. Strength grew from 4.2 to 4.3, constitution from 4.1 to 4.2, and will from 4.5 to 4.6. Obviously, the growth rate had declined compared to last month. Dexterity, charisma, spirit, and perception showed no growth, and he realized that any stat exceeding 5 points wouldn't show any increase unless he had special training or conditions. Massacre was still level 2. Killing more than 40 animals wasn't enough to level it up. As Roy concentrated on his EXP bar and willed himself to level up, the EXP bar changed and a message appeared. Level 2, 3000, you gain one attribute point and one skill point. He added the attribute point into perception. After experiencing that magical feeling of control once more, Roy's perception turned from 6 to 7. It was the highest amongst his stats, and another message showed up on the character sheet. You have unlocked a new function, unnamed level 1. Your perception has gone beyond the limits of an average human, evolving into a sixth sense. You may gain your target's basic information through a special observation method. The higher the target's perception, the stronger it will suppress your skill, and the less information you will get from them. Level 1 increases your perception by 1 when you observe your targets. Roy paused for a moment. I can get a skill when I level up my stat to a certain point? Huh. Never expected that. The new skill came as a surprise for him. It was a tactical one. If he could observe his enemies in silence and get their basic information as well as their skills before a fight, Roy could come up with some strategies to take out his enemies efficiently. The higher his perception, the further his range. He could, theoretically, Stay in the dark a few miles away and know everything about his enemies before they fought. The possibility of that happening excited him, and he thought about how he could pick out his enemy's weak points from a thousand feet away and shoot them from that range. Damn, if that happens, Roy willed a name change and called his new skill Observe. He wouldn't spend his skill point for the time being. Roy wanted to test his new skill before deciding to invest it in Level 2 Massacre or Level 1 Observe. Thompson and Jack were good practice targets for his skill. Roy told his parents where he would be going, and he left merrily. Not long after going out, he noticed the streets looking lively, a stark contrast to the air of despair the village had earlier. Dozens of villagers surrounded the bulletin board in the city center, and they buzzed with excitement. It was as if the terror brought by the grave hag had never existed. Roy was curious about their delight, and he went to the square. The witchers are here. We're saved. Three travelers stood amongst the crowd, and Roy noticed they were different, for their features and attire were outstanding. The man on the left side of the bulletin board had a red headband on his forehead. He had a cool expression, and his features were defined and sculpted. The man on his right covered half his face under a gray hood, the laugh lines on his cheeks running deep, and a faint smile danced on his lips. He looked slightly similar to the man with the red tie, and Roy thought they must have been related. Both men stood at six feet tall. Par N. Six feet is around 1.83 meters. The third man was bald, his head gleaming under the sun. He had an aquiline nose, a pair of sunken eyes, and a stern expression. He was a towering giant whose muscles were as hard as rocks. He stood over six feet four, and his arms were crossed. The bald man loomed over everyone, suffocating those around him by just standing there. PRN. Six feet four is around 1.93 meters. The trio wore black armor decorated with crisscrossing claw marks and dried blood. A satchel the size of a fist was tied to their belts, and Roy saw vials hanging on the potion belt that was thrown over their shoulders. A pair of crossing short swords were strapped to their breastplates, and a few finger-length daggers hung from their leg armor. Peculiar necklaces dangled in front of the witcher's chest. It was in the shape of a viper rearing its head back, forming a mysterious, complex sign. Their swords measured four feet four long and slept in a black sheath. 
Arguably the most peculiar thing about the trio were their eyes. They were amber in color, just like the eyes of cats. They looked bizarre and terrifying. PRN, 4 feet 4, is around 1.32 meters. Roy stared at the bald man, who was leading the trio. He thought he looked familiar, and something swirled within Roy's eyes. A moment later, a translucent information page appeared out of thin air above the bald man's head. Litho, gender, mage, 80, status, witcher, viper school, underwent three mutations when he was a child, endured the trial of the grasses, possesses extraordinary speed, strength, reflexes, coordination, life force, and regenerative abilities, has received professional training in swordsmanship, alchemy, and has knowledge of the bestiary, possesses a formidable immune system, is immune to most plagues and diseases, can resist most lethal poisons, mastered the witcher signs, pseudo spells, possesses a long life, but is sterile. HP, unable to retrieve information, requires higher perception, mana, strength, dexterity, constitution, perception 19, will, charisma 6, spirit 10, skill, alchemy level, unable to retrieve skill level, requires higher perception, crafting skill, allows the user to create oils, potions, poisons, and bombs. Witcher senses level, after the trial of the grasses, a witcher's senses will undergo a mutation that will strengthen them. Their five senses are linked to their instincts, allowing them to see scents and voices. It also lets them discover tracks or clues that are usually impossible to see. Meditation level, training for the body and soul. Meditating calms the witcher's body and mind, hastening the regeneration of their body, mana, and stamina. Improves coordination over time and raises affinity with chaos energy. Viper School, dual wielding level, a skill created by a Viper School Witcher through a century of development. Allows the Witcher to dual wield daggers during combat against monsters. A secret skill not taught in other schools. Witcher Signs level, after their mutations, Witchers that had no affinity with chaos energy would awaken their ability to cast simple pseudo spells. Signs are the core abilities of Witchers. No incantation or materials needed, a mere hand gesture is enough to expand their mana and activate the signs. There are five signs. Quen creates a protective shield that blocks any attack. Ard casts a telekinetic force that knocks enemies back and destroys obstacles. Igni casts a stream of fire from the palm that expands into a cone. Yurden summons a magical trap that lowers the speed and reflex of anyone aside from the user that enters. Effective against phantom type, incorporeal creatures. Axi hypnotizes and controls the target, forcing it to do as the user wishes. The strength of signs depends on the spirit stat and skill level. Other. By the gods. Roy was shocked after reading through Letho's information. So this is a witcher? Their skills and stats are way over the top. And he's an 80-year-old man? Are you kidding me? Letho was already 80 years old, but he looked not a day over 35. The body under that armor was strong, taut, and full of vigor. Roy could practically smell his life force from where he stood. It had a tang of blood in it. Most of Letho's stats and skills couldn't be seen because Roy's perceptu n wasn't high enough. If Roy didn't know better, he'd have said Letho was a beast in human skin. So the witchers are as strong as they say. Saw them a lot in the game, but meeting them in real life is a shock to me. Letho and his companions are from the Viper School. It was then that Roy remembered where he'd seen Letho he realized that the trio before him would assassinate the kings of Edirn, Temeria, and Caedwin in a few years. Everyone knew of them as the assassins from the Viper School, the Kingslayers. Why'd they come up to the north instead of staying in Nilfgaard, where their base is located? Letho's eyes were calm, but also dark. They swept over everyone before announcing, I am Letho, a witcher from the Viper School. His voice was clear, deep, and appealing. They're my companions, Seret and Aukis. We'll be taking this job, but we'll need more information to decide on our pay. The wizened chief heaved a sigh of relief after hearing Letho's announcement. At least you're not from the cat school. Viper school is good enough. The village chief looked reassured, as if he'd had bad encounters with the witchers from the cat school before. As the chief was about to say something, a scraggy boy pushed through the throng and went up to the witchers. I saw that monster. I can tell you all about it. The boy who spoke up was Roy. The witchers went to Ol, captain's inn with him, 
and ask for some ale before they listened to the testimonies of the survivors, who were Roy, Jack, and Thompson. They described the horrifying events in detail. It's a grave hag, Letho said, arriving at the conclusion without hesitating. That's worth at least a hundred crowns. Roy, is it? Tell the chief to prepare the bounty. We'll attack at high noon when the sun's the strongest, if it goes without a hitch. He pointed at the grandfather clock in the corner with his pudgy finger. We'll return with the trophy before three. Letho's expression didn't change throughout the explanation, as if the killing of the monster was a trivial matter. But Roy knew that might not be what Letho was feeling. Some witchers would end up with a perpetual poker face after the trial of the grasses. They could never show any expression, but they would still be as emotional and sensitive as anyone else. I mean, Geralt always has a poker face too, but he can be passionate, like C-137 Rick. Perhaps annoyed by the fact Roy was staring at them for a long time, the grumpy Serret snapped at him. Have you never seen a witcher, boy? Why are you looking at us that way? Do you think we're scums, or horrors from hell? Oh no. On the contrary, I think witchers can be trusted with our lives. Roy looked into Serret's amber eyes sincerely, bearing his affection for witchers in the open. He spent many hours playing as a witcher, and it was an unforgettable experience. Roy even dived into the lore of the Witcher series so he could know more about the game and its story. He knew the witchers like the back of his hand. Fate was cruel on them. Most of them were taken in because wars made them orphans. Left with nowhere to go, the schools adopted them. Some, though, were given away by their parents as compensation for witchers that died during missions. Fun was non-existent after they started living in the Witcher schools. They were isolated from the world, and all their time was occupied by treacherous training that could drive anyone insane. If they wanted to explore the world, they would have to pass the trial of the grasses, but the death rate was impossibly high. They took requests from ordinary humans and risked their lives killing monsters, all so they could make a living off the bounties they received but they were ostracized by everyone because of their bizarre looks and extraordinary battle prowess. Everyone thought they were uncaring, evil, heralds of hell, but only cat school witchers and specific individuals would kill the innocent. Most witchers were reputable, upright people, but they were spared no warmth by the humans. Witchers could on, lie find solace amongst themselves. After they picked themselves up, it was another day of fighting monsters. A witcher's life was filled with battles, and there they would meet their end. None died peacefully. The witchers were legendary, but also cursed by fate. Roy said from his heart, Witchers have saved innocent lives from monsters. You guys are better than those soldiers who take our money, but do nothing. Ha, Serret, as if hearing something funny, smiled stiffly, but it didn't hide the mockery in his eyes. Been a while since I heard someone praise us like that. Don't waste our time, kid. Tell us what you really want. Roy put on a serious look. I want to go with you on the mission at noon. Serret stood up. Impossible, he said, refusing. We're hunting a monster here, not a harmless animal. We don't have time to keep an eye on you. Listen to me, please. Roy mustered his sincerity. My friend and teacher who taught me my trade were killed by that bastard. I want to kill it with my own hands, and I see it even in my dreams. You can understand how I feel, can't you? Sarit and his companions looked at each other. No, child, you're wrong. Witchers don't have feelings. Sarit was still refusing him. Jack, who had been quiet for a while, interjected. Witcher's Roy may be young, but he has a steady hand, and he works well with the crossbow. Take him to the cemetery with you. He can watch from afar and shoot bolts whenever he has the chance. There'd be no danger to it. If you think he's still more trouble than he's worth, I'll add fifty crowns on top of the reward the chief promised. Roy gawked at Jack, surprised he was helping instead of stopping him, and fifty crowns wasn't a small sum. He took the chance and guaranteed, I won't be a bother, I promise. I can stay back and wait for your command to shoot. You're just a young human boy. Why would you want to face that monster? What's your reason? Letho, the bald witcher, bored his eyes into Roy and the boy felt like he was being seen through. The amber twinkle from Letho's eyes made his heart skip nervously. After a short while of silence, he said, Fine, we agree to your request, 
but only because you're adding 50 crowns on top of the bounty. Chapter 12. Head of the Hag Letho had seen everything throughout his years of being a witcher, but not once had he seen a child as peculiar as Roy. Not only was Roy unafraid of witchers, but he also didn't avoid them like the plague, unlike everyone else. Letho wasn't kidding. Many children would cry in fear after seeing a witcher's peculiar looks. Roy, however, had no such fear or disgust. He had a weird look in his eyes. Letho thought it resembled affection, or even admiration. I'm getting old. Sentimentality isn't like me. Letho fell into a trance, but he kept his poker face. Letho hearkened back to the days of his younger self. He'd still been a young boy when someone had come to his hometown of Gulet and brought him to Gorther Gvide, the Viper School's stronghold in Tir Toker. Back then, Letho hadn't gone through the trial of the grasses yet. He'd look at his mentor, Ivar Evil Eye, the founder of Viper School, as he stood on the lectern and taught the Viper School disciples the knowledge of witchers and his life experience. He used to have the same look of admiration in his eyes that Roy did, but time showed him no mercy. A few decades ago, Ivor Evil Eye went missing when he was hunting down a Garcane. At the same time, cat school witchers had been massacring humans on a whim, and it had garnered bad press from the people. Bereaved by the loss of their founder and the hatred from the people, Viper School went into a decline, and fewer people came to Gorther Gvide. The only witchers of the Viper School left were him, Serret, Aukus, and two others whose trails were unknown. Over the last twenty years, none of the disciples managed to pass the trial of the grasses. We have to revive the Viper School, kill our nemesis, and find Ivar Evil Eye. Those were Letho's wishes, and the reason for their activity in the Northern Realms. When he came back to the present, he gave Roy a gentle look. It had been a sunny day, praise Melatele. The trio made meticulous preparations before they went for the hunt. After all, no human could master their skills even if they'd wanted to, and they didn't keep that a secret from Roy. They took out a vial of amber goo from the satchels they kept on their belts and poured it on the short swords taken from their breastplates. The witchers spread it evenly and slowly, but their movements were still enthusing. After their short swords had been coated in amber, they checked and double-checked the potions on their potion belts, the amount they had left, and how much they could afford to use. Then they tied colorful alchemy bombs where they could easily reach it. It was already noon when everything was done. After the witchers had departed the village, Roy snuck out at the promised hour behind his parents' back. At the same time, a few curious villagers came along. Half an hour later, Roy finally made it to the cemetery after a long sprint. He was huffing and puffing as he held his stomach, and he bent over and retched. The witchers looked at the cemetery not far away from them, and they heightened their sight to observe their surroundings. Stay here, Roy. We'll call you once we defeat the hag. Please let me kill that bastard myself, witchers. Letho didn't answer. He, Aukas, and Serret took out a vial filled with a brown potion and gulped it down. The moment they did, the blood vessels on their faces turned black and squirmed. Their faces were contorted, and the murder in their eyes was almost palpable. Roy shivered, but not from the cold. Letho started moving, and in spite of his size, the man's actions were as fluid and as quiet as a cat as he bent down and darted into the cemetery. Letho started moving, but contrary to his size, he bent down and darted into the cemetery, fluid and quiet as a cat. Not a soul stirred, and not a leaf rustled. Serret and Akas went to the rear and followed Letho. The cemetery was laid bare for all to see under the sunlight. It looked tranquil, quiet, and even holy, as rays of light sprinkled upon the tombstones. But beside the skele, Tal remains of the dead, all the witchers could see when they looked closer were two dried corpses that had turned grayish-brown. From its structure, they deduced that the body had belonged to a tall, sturdy male adult, but it was rotten beyond recognition. The witchers couldn't discern who he was. The wounds on the body told of a great struggle before the victim met his fate. Bones were fractured in multiple places, and there were holes on every joint, apparently bored through by a sharp object. After the analysis, Letho closed his eyes quietly, and his nose wrinkled as he searched for clues. Not even the rotten stench from the corpses could stop him from finding the monster's tracks. 
A short while later, he set his eyes on the cabin in the cemetery's center. Letho took out a transparent headspace vial and continued his search around the locked cabin. Grave hags fear the sun. They would cover up any places that would let the light into their nests. No sunlight should pierce through their hideout, but this cabin was prepared for the gravekeeper. There must be an entrance somewhere. Litho found the window a few moments later, but the grave hag had covered it with mud. It's not rock. This will work. Letho threw his knife and easily made an opening before chucking his alchemy bomb into the hole. The smashing of the glass window was heard, and Letho darted back without hesitating. He leaped onto the roof, not unlike a cat. He then signaled to his teammates, and Aukis and Serret, who were already waiting, dashed to the cabin's front door, waiting to flank the creature once it came out. Serret made two triangles with his left hand that resembled an hourglass in the air and pushed it forward. A faint, white light shot up into the air, and a ten-foot radius magical circle appeared on the ground, flashing softly. Alkaz made a sign in the shape of an upright triangle with his right hand, but he didn't push it out yet. He was waiting for the opening. A moment later, the door was kicked open with a loud bang, and the misshapen, lumpy creature shot out into the open. The moment it took its first step, it slammed into an invisible wall. It trembled for a moment and fell face first. That was the opening Aukis was waiting for. He pushed the Igni sign forward, and a stream of fire erupted from his palm, expanding out into a cone, and the flames licked the fallen monster. Before it came out, the grave hag had already been splattered with oil by the bomb Letho tossed into the cabin. Igni's fire quickly traveled along its body, turning the monster into a writhing torch. Tortured by the pain of the fire, the grave hag let out a shrill scream. It raised its gnarly arms and with its body, tried to break the magical barrier Akas had erected. It was then that someone leaped down from the roof and stood before the grave hag. What awaited the monster was a barrage of slashes. The short sword cut through the creature without mercy, drawing arcs across its body ten times in a moment. The weapon glinted cruelly as it circled it, slowly whittling its life down with every cut. Roy was watching from afar, and no matter how he did it, he still couldn't see the witcher's movement clearly. It was far too swift for him. Letho was the only one attacking the grave hag, but Roy saw three afterimages around it. A few grueling moments later, the grave hag fell down helplessly. Most of its body was burnt and cut by the blades. After, its limbs broke off from its body, as if realizing they had been cut off one second too late. What was left was a limbless creature, squirming and hanging on to life by a thread. Alkis went up to it and pressed down on its back with his kneecap. He had a glove over his right hand, and he quickly yanked something from the grave hag's mouth. It was a long, thin, prickled tongue out. And ignoring the monster's ghastly wails, Aukis cut it off and tossed it into a canister he'd prepared. Letho took out a blue cloth from his satchel and wiped the green blood off his short sword, his movements gentle and meticulous. Tuh, he grave hag was severely injured, but Letho didn't suffer any wounds at all. He was as calm and collected as the moment Roy met him. Nay, he didn't even break a sweat. It was as if he wasn't the one doing battle with the monster. The battle had come to an end at that point. The witcher with the red headband, Serret, called Roy to join them, and he came out of his hiding spot. This monster is still living, but barely. As per our agreement, the kill shall be yours. Serret looked at the crossbow Roy was holding. Will you be ending its misery with that? As Roy came closer to look at the limbless creature, he was at a loss for words. He had prepared a speech, but the visual impact made him forget about it. Even though he knew of the witcher's strength and was prepared to see them easily kill a monster, their skills still blew his mind. The whole battle only lasted two minutes. Before anyone could warm up for the show, the deed was already done. The monster that had killed Seeger, Fletcher, and Brandon so easily was now a mere sitting duck before the Kingslayers. Ironic. I showed some respect, though. This is vengeance, after all. Roy had hunkered down and unsheathed the short sword on his back. He'd found it in Fletcher's house. He stuck the edge on the grave hag's nape and looked at the pair of corpses in the cemetery. He put on a mirthless smile and shouted to the heavens, You're avenged, Uncle Fletcher Seeger, snotty brat! 
Roy made one final slash, separating the grave hag's head from its lifeless body, and the big, ugly thing rolled toward Letho. At the same time, a new message appeared on Roy's character sheet. You have killed a grave hag. EXP gained 100, 103,000. This monster gives 10 times the EXP a beast would? Chapter 13. Convince Letho took out a gleaming dagger and cut up the grave hag. His movements were as fluid as those of a butcher who had complete understanding of the anatomy of all livestock. Letho cut out its eyes, ears, and those mysterious lumps. He laid them out in a neat row on his blue cloth, then dug out a few twisted, misshapen pieces of meat and shook them. Lucky find. This hag's mutagen is ripe enough to make some potions. What are those, witcher? Letho gave Roy silent praise after the boy asked him the question. He killed that grave hag in its death throes without even blinking, and he didn't even look away when we dismembered it. What an oddity. Anyone else would have vomited their stomachs out, including adults. Roy's bravery and courage piqued Letho's interest. This one has potential. Letho pointed at the parts he cut out, telling Roy their names and explaining their use to him patiently. Roy listened in silence, frowning occasionally as he mulled over what the Witcher told him. Right, Roy. Do you have a family? Letho asked, sounding nonchalant. I'm living with my parents. Letho was disappointed to hear that, and he hastened the dismembering of the grave hag. The gas from Letho's bomb, which had been thrown into the cabin earlier, had dissipated after an hour, and they entered the late gravekeeper's abode. What was once a place humans could comfortably stay in was now an eerie, horrifying hellhole. Filthy mud covered the walls, roof, and floor of the place. Some of it even dripped off the ceiling like glue. The abode, once warm and well-lit, was now humid and dark. Here and there, canisters and bizarre containers lay haphazardly. The grave hag seemed to have been making something before it had met its grisly end. The bones of humans and small creatures hung on the mud-caked walls. After Roy saw what was hanging on the innermost wall, he rushed to it. Brandon. Nothing was left of the fat, snotty child who used to pester him about magic tricks, save for his rotten corpse. It was pierced by a black spear, making him a human flag. The eyes on his dried, sunken head were gouged out, leaving two gaping holes that stared back at Roy. His mouth was open in fear, and Roy could imagine the terror he'd felt when he was alive. Roy closed his eyes and took a deep breath before taking the corpse down carefully. He hugged it without any feeling of disgust, as if he couldn't smell the stench of mold and rotten meat. I'm sorry. If I had been more patient and didn't say that to you. Then a big, warm hand patted his shoulder. Be at peace. You have avenged them. The Witcher consoled him, which was a rare case. A short while later, Roy buried the corpses of Seeger, Fletcher, and Brandon. With the help of the Witchers, he managed to finish their tombstones. Here lies Seeger, the blacksmith of Care, the son of Skellige, his courage was proven in battle, died September 1260 in a valiant battle against a grave hag. The other grave had two names carved on them. Fletcher, Butcher of Care, a loving father who chose to show but not tell it. Brandon, friend of the Rooster Slayer, future bard and magician. He shall shine as bright as a star in the kingdom of Melitello. Died September 1260. After laying the dead to rest, Roy went back to the village with the Witchers. Susie and Moore came up to him in tears, and they insisted on giving him a checkup. The witchers brandished the ugly head of the grave hag, showing it to the villagers, before taking their reward from the village chief and one-eyed Jack. The cemetery monster crisis had come to an end with the grave hag's death, but something else happened. Much to the surprise of the villagers, the witchers didn't immediately leave after receiving the reward. Instead, they went to the inn and stayed in a room. After the grave hag had been killed, the villagers had directed their fear toward the witchers. Whispers traveled the village, most of them showing their disgust and hatred toward them. The monsters killed, and they took their R, Eward. Why aren't those mutants leaving? Look at them. They look evil. This can't go on, chief. You have to find a way to chase them out. We can only let them stay for one night at most. Parents, beware. Don't sleep these next couple of nights. At least wait until they leave. I heard witchers love to take kids away and turn them into disgusting mutants. 
When Roy heard the ignorant words of prejudice from the villagers, he shook his head in disdain and left the crowd. He went to the inn where the witchers were chugging ale and chatting with Jack. To be precise, Jack was the one doing the talking, bragging about his Gwent skills. Jack, who had stayed on the Skellige Isles for decades, didn't have the same inexplicable hatred for the witchers, unlike the villagers. That damned brat, Roy. It's impossible for someone to be that skilled in Gwent. He won sixty crowns from me. Sixty. Witchers, you're better than me in Gwent. Can you teach that brat a lesson for me? An hour later, Letho's perpetual poker face faltered for a moment, and he took out a handful of crowns from his satchel. Fifteen crowns, he sighed. That's a tenth of the reward gone. All right, child, you've won your crowns, now let us talk business. You do not fear us, and you approach us of your own volition. Why is that? Are you interested in the tale of witchers? Which one would you like to hear? Letho and his companions exchanged glances and sat around Roy, their interrogatory gazes fixed on him. Roy's heart skipped a beat, but he didn't hide his intentions. The boy smiled and told them honestly, So you've realized. My goal is to become a witcher. If I'm right, you live long lives, are always healthy, never fall sick, and possess unimaginable strength. Every Witcher 3 player had the dream of becoming a witcher. He could still remember what Florenz Delanoy wrote in his book, Fairy Tales and Stories. I wish for neither riches nor fame, neither power nor influence. I wish for a horse, as black and swift as a nightly gale. I wish for a sword, as bright and keen as a moonbeam. I wish to overstride the world on my black horse through the black night. I wish to smite the forces of evil and darkness with my luminous blade. This I would have. Crossing over to the world of the Witcher was one of his wishes in life. Hold it, Sarit interjected. If I'm understanding this correctly, you're saying you admire mutants? Is that true? He looked at Roy closely. Are you sure you aren't thirty, Roy? Who told you Witchers were admirable? Yes, we might be strong, long-living, and free from disease, but that doesn't mean we live admirable lives. Sarit chuckled. He rolled his eyes and took a gulp of his liquor. Being a witcher is a curse, he spat, almost crazed. We're shackled for life, doomed to a grisly death. You shouldn't envy us. It should be the other way around. People despise us because of what we are. You don't have to go through that. Our lives are filled with nothing but hatred and misery. One moment we're living, but the next, we might just be running for our lives. Roy's face stiffened, and he moved backward. He couldn't get used to Sarit's grumpy demeanor, sharp retorts, and facial expressions. It was unbecoming of a witcher. Sarit acted much younger than his age. He's more like Lambert, Geralt's friend. Letho and Aukas crossed their arms, keeping silent as Sarit tried to dissuade Roy. Boy, you're a good child, so here's some advice. Stay in the village. Give up on going on adventures and killing monsters. It's not every day someone will defeat the monsters for you, so you can take the last hit. Sarit chugged some more liquor. You'll know I'm doing this for your own good once you get married and have a child in a few years. Oh, he thinks I killed the grave hag just to get a taste of adventure? Sirid is right, Letho agreed, but he sounded crestfallen. If you want to be a witcher just because of the strength and monster killing, there is no need for further conversation. This is a path paved with pain, and P, leisure, is nowhere to be found. You have your own family, so just live your life as a normal human. Take that advice. But at least you can protect yourselves, Roy retorted, unwilling to give up. Before this, the only way he could have gained EXP was by taking great risks. But now, he was shown a more professional, comprehensive, and effective way to gain power. Roy felt the need to grab that chance, because he wouldn't get another. He could also see the witchers hesitating. If I'm stronger than an average human, I won't become prey to things like that monster. At least, I won't get dismembered like my friend and mentor were. Don't worry about it. I've been in the witcher business for years, and I can tell you this for sure. Aukus downed his beer and let out a hearty laugh. Those monsters are going to thin out quickly unless the conjunction of the spheres happens again. If it does, we'll have a monster crisis on our hands. If not, most monsters won't come to hunt in care. Your village is going to enjoy many years of peace from now on. There is no reason to worry. But monsters aren't the only threats. Humans, disease, and wars are equally as dangerous. 
Roy's retort quieted the witchers. A long while later, Sarat mocked, You're one peculiar child. What's even in that head of yours? You're certainly acting older than your age, and by a lot. And you were showing bizarre signs in the cemetery. Are you a paranoid person? I've never seen anyone wish to become a witcher of their own volition. You're a fool. I'm just precautious. Roy drank some of the dwarven liquor, and the alcohol gave him liquid courage. Whether you believe me or not, I've been dreaming about horrifying things since I was a child. All I see are bloody, unfortunate events burning the earth. The dreams have gotten more frequent over the last few years. Roy paused. Something tells me a great war will come in three years, and bodies will pile as high as mountains. I think I should learn how to survive before that happens, eh? Witchers are fine mentors, or at least that's what I think. You lie, child, Sarat scoffed. That is but a story you've woven. You can dream of the future, but you're not a seer. I knew you wouldn't buy it. Roy shook his head and sighed. He wasn't lying, for the First Northern War would start in the year 1263, a mere three years away. Maybe the war has already started somewhere else. I just want to be that bit stronger, enough to keep me and my family safe. I don't have to be as strong as veteran witchers. I just need to send Moore and Susie to Novigrad. They can live a better, safer life there. Letho tapped the table with his pudgy fingers. You don't know what witchers have to go through. I know of their infertility and the trial of the grasses. It's almost certain death. Letho froze after hearing that, and his companion's expressions changed. How do you know that? Have you run into other witches before? I dreamed of it, but I guess you won't believe me. Of course we won't, but I can see you're serious about becoming a witcher, Letho answered solemnly. You have one last chance to think this through, brat. No need for that. I've been thinking about this my whole life. Well, even if I train with witchers, it's not guaranteed I'll become one. Not a bad backup plan, though. Letho looked at his companions, who nodded at him. Then he extended his big hand toward Roy. We'll be leaving care tomorrow. Will you come with us then, brat? Roy shook Letho's gigantic hand, but he pretended to hesitate. Yes, but not now. I need to make enough money and settle my parents in Novigrad. If you can trust us, Sarat and Akas will escort your parents to Novigrad. Letho interjected, and he waved his hand at Roy. They have business in that city. You got one thing right. Novigrad is safer than care. Letho had given him the answer he'd wanted. Say, what do you think of this? Since Roy was going to be a trainee, Sarat changed his attitude toward him. He held the viper necklace up and told Roy, In earnest, Aukus and I will set up a booth in Novigrad for your parents. They can open a business there and settle down faster. By the name of the Viper School, we promise you that. That's just what I need. Roy observed the brothers closely and heaved a sigh of relief after seeing that they weren't lying. That was the best outcome he could hope for. But you'll be spending a lot of crowns by helping me. Letho shrugged, dismissing Roy's worries. No amount of crowns is more important than a great disciple for the Viper School. To tell you the truth, it's been twenty years since we've had any new recruits. No recruits, no deaths. And you performed well back in the cemetery. You're the only child I've seen approach a witcher of his own volition, and you're persistent. You might have a better chance of passing the trial. Yes, you're not the youngest, but it's better than nothing. Chapter 14. The Journey Begins Roy agreed to Letho's invitation. Being a witcher was not a bad choice for him, for he hadn't discovered any talent for being a mage. Everything went mostly according to plan. The only deviation was instead of going to the familiar wolf school, Roy was going to the viper school, a school that was almost gone from history, and one that was known for its assassinations, poisons, and witchers who used short swords. But Roy couldn't let the opportunity slip away. Staying in this remote village would hamper his growth. The village would have to face the Nilfgaardian invasion in the near future, and they might have to fend off new monsters. There were too many untold dangers if he stayed there. Even if he trained for just three years, with a veteran witcher like Letho, Roy could grow stronger by leaps and bounds, and he could learn about the trade of witchers. If he managed to pass the trial of the grasses, his strength would spike. So what if I become sterile? Roy had never thought about having kids, 
even in his old world, let alone this new one. Convincing his parents to move to Novigrad hadn't been a difficult task. They weren't even 40 years old, and they looked forward to the big city life. They had no attachment to the village, unlike the elderly, though they were still nervous. It was rare to have a witcher promise their mentorship, but Roy had a problem. His parents objected to him leaving their side. Roy wasn't even 14. Even though children in medieval society grew up faster, no 14-year-old would leave their parents. The teens relied on them for survival, and no parent would want their child to risk their lives training with witchers. Roy had to make up a lie. Dad, Susie, I'm just a trainee, and I'm not going to get into any battles. Think of me as his assistant, like how I was when I worked for Uncle Fletcher. The job's different, though. Witchers have lousy money management skills, and they don't know how to spend the money from their bounty. Most of the time, they use up all the crowns they earn in a year in a few days. At least Roy wasn't lying about that part. Most witchers knew nothing about money management. Risking their lives for a living drilled the need for instant gratification into them. The moment they made money from requests, most would spend it on ale, brothels, or gwent. Regular maintenance of their gear and the purchasing of alchemy materials cost many crowns, and most witchers lived request to request. Geralt of Rivia was one of them. Sometimes, he even needed his friends to help him pay off some of his bills. I'm just going to manage his accounts. Think of me as a banker in Vivaldi's bank, and we won't be separated for too long. I'll come to Novigrad to visit, I promise. You're lying, Roy, my boy. Since you were a babe, you never even learned how to read. How are you supposed to know how to count? Susie and Moore didn't believe Roy until he showed them some basic math formulas. Of course, that was thanks to Luo Yi. Everyone was dumbfounded at the calculations, including the witchers. Susie and Moore couldn't refuse their son anymore, so they bought into his lie, and they cried at the thought of separation. They spent a day packing all the valuables from their house, which only amounted to a few sets of clothes. They had to leave the land behind because it wasn't theirs to possess. And then off to Novigrad they went, with the witchers escorting them. Most of the villagers came out to watch the spectacle, but none of them bid a happy farewell. Most showed contempt and disgust. Traditions of old had entrenched themselves deep within the souls of the villagers. To them, Witchers were nothing but tools used to destroy monsters. Aside from that, they saw them as filthy mutants and harbingers of disaster. Their prejudice against the witchers blinded them from seeing the reason Susie and Moore were following the witchers to Novigrad. After their decision to move had spread throughout the village, many villagers came to dissuade them. S. Yuzi and Moore did hesitate, but Roy managed to convince them. He was a better decision-maker than they were. And after what happened to Fletcher and Brandon, Roy was disappointed in the villagers. Before his departure, Roy's only friend, One-Eyed Jack, came to see him off, and he patted Roy's head. Time flies. You used to be a shy little lad, but now you're one brave, persistent little brat. I knew you'd leave this shithole of a place sooner or later. Ah, the light in your eyes reminds me of my younger days. I can see them speaking of ambition and secrets untold. Really? Roy didn't think he was ambitious, he only wanted a bit of adventure. You ain't coming back after this, are you? I would have gone with you, but this bag of bones can't take any more hits. Oh, right, since you avenged my dead drinking buddy, here's a farewell gift. One-Eyed Jack handed a 35-card Gwent deck to Roy reluctantly. This is my prized possession, the Skellige deck. No hero cards in here, but all the rare cards are present. Take it with you, and show your skills to the world. I wish you the best. Those cities always have Gwent competitions going on, so go forth and conquer, kid. Roy took the deck solemnly and placed it near his heart, then sent it into his inventory space. This whole deck is worth 200 crowns, easy. Jack gave me one expensive gift. When you get to Novigrad, if you have the time, pay a visit to number 320 on the east side of the river. If you see an old git named Frank, tell him I said hi. After relaying his request, Jack gave Roy a hug that almost crushed the boy's ribs and waved him goodbye. As the white smoke over care grew farther and farther, something stirred within Roy. 
Half of the soul within the body belonged to a boy who'd lived his entire life in that village. He was reluctant to leave, but that reluctance was swept away by the longing for a new adventure. Moore and Susie had hugged Roy for a long time before bidding him a tearful goodbye. Sarit and Akas led them to the carriage, and they traveled north of Lower Posada, their first stop being the capital of Adern, Vengerberg. There, they would switch carriages and travel west, entering Redania through Temeria, and finally reaching Novigrad. They could only do so by carriage, and it would take a month for them to reach their destination. On the other hand, Letho and Roy were in casual attire, and they hopped onto a horse. Letho would take Roy with him, for the boy knew nothing about horse riding. They traveled west to the sea, zipping through Aldersburg and passing the Mahakam mountain range on the way. The pair's destination was the kingdom, an ocean away from the Skellige Isles. Sintra. They'd lied to Susie and more. The pair wouldn't visit Novigrad for the time being. Letho told Roy he'd need to collect the special herbs and mutagens needed for the trial of the grasses along the way. At the same time, he would mentor Roy and put him through tests. Letho himself would be going to conduct an investigation in Sintra. Once Susie and Moore were settled down, Aukas and Serret would rendezvous with them there. This trip is just what I need, Roy thought. Since we're in 1260, the lion cub of Sintra, Cyrilla Fiona Ellen Rhiannon should be around eight or nine years old. She's betrothed to Kistrin, the Prince of Verdun by now. I wonder if Ciri's left home on her own yet. Roy wanted to see if Ciri was as unappealing as the paintings depicted her to be. Chapter 15. A Night in the Wilds. Here, chew on this and put it over your wound. Letho tossed a flower with vermilion petals to Roy, his face inscrutable. As Letho looked at Roy, who was rubbing his leg in pain, his lips curled into a faint smile. Letho had zipped across the land after their departure from care, not stopping for dozens of miles. He'd only slowed to rest in the wilds when dusk had descended. A burning pain was shooting up from Roy's inner thigh. When he looked into his trousers, a crimson pool was forming on his thighs, where his skin was torn by rough fabric. He'd lost 5 HP, and his character sheet showed 3742 HP. Roy's constitution was worse than an average adult's. He wouldn't be able to ride a horse before his wound healed, which would take days. I can't even ride a horse. Why'd I do this with witchers? They're superhumans. Am I dumb? What did you give me, Letho? Roy's teeth chattered from the pain. He chomped on the herb in his mouth, grinding it to a pulp. It had a fine, refreshing flavor, unlike most herbs, which had bitter tastes. Marigold. Ever heard of it? Letho tossed a piece of firewood into the campfire, and the flames crackled. Kills the pain and prevents infection. You can find it outside of towns. They grow everywhere, he explained patiently. Roy paid attention to what he said and made a mental note of what Letho told him. Part of the reason he treaded the path of the Witcher was for useful information, like the ones Letho gave him. Witchers could live for many centuries, making them a treasure trove of experience. Roy would try to get everything he could out of them, allowing him to get stronger. Letho tossed a few pieces of dry, hard jerky to him as he held his pot of ale and looked into the evening sky, chewing on his food in silence. A while later, he unbuckled his sword and laid on the ground, using his arms as a pillow. The ground was his bed and the sky his blanket. Letho looked calm and relaxed, as if the wilds were his home. It was normal for witchers to camp in the wilderness for most parts of the year anyway. When the scent of wine wafted to him, Roy gulped. Can I have a taste? His leg felt awkward to move after he'd plastered marigold on it. When Letho said nothing, Roy took the wineskin and had a taste. The moment he took a sip, his neck craned, his eyes bulged, and his tongue stuck out. What is this? A sour and spicy taste mixed together like a bizarre concoction, and it made Roy spew out the wine. Letho's face fell. Don't drink if you can't take it, child. I went through a lot of trouble to get that from Beauclair. It's est est. Not everyone has the chance to even taste it in their lifetime. This wine is a tribute item. Savor it. Savor it? There is nothing to savor. The wine isn't good, Roy answered honestly. Old Captain's Inn has better wine. I like its fruit wine. Even its dwarven liquor is better. And then Roy shifted the topic. You mentioned Beauclair just now. If I remember correctly, that's in Toussaint, isn't it? Have you gone there before? 
then you must have seen Duchess Anna Henrietta. Is she as beautiful as the rumors have it? Toussaint was the duchy where the DLC Blood and Wine took place. Its fairy tale esque scenery had left a lasting impression on Roy. Of course, there was also the army of higher vampires, the lustful cloud sex, and the beautiful duchess. We didn't see the duchess, only her husband, Duke Raymond. Letho peered at Roy. You're from a pigsty and Adern boy. By all accounts, you shouldn't know the duchess' name. How do you? Toussaint was a duchy in Nilfgaard, a far, far place from Adern. The more he talked to Roy, the more Letho thought he was strange. He must have a lot of secrets. I told you why, but you don't believe me. The witchers hadn't believed Roy's lie about him seeing the future in his dreams. Roy huddled closer to the crackling fire and rubbed his hands. Do all witchers live long lives like you, Letho? Most lose their lives when fulfilling requests to hunt down monsters. Either that, or they fall in battle. Not even half make it to fifty. Roy smiled. He knew of an old master in the wolf school who was already two hundred. Maybe the other schools have witchers like that too. Do you regret your choice then? Letho suddenly turned back to stare at him. Being a witcher might kill you faster than being a peasant would. Honestly, a bit. Hmm. A faint murderous intent rose from Letho. Roy quickly changed his answer. Sorry. It's the alcohol talking. I won't regret this. Those gits have sent your parents to Novigrad as promised. If you change your mind halfway through, the Viper School isn't filled with madmen like the Cat School, but we show no mercy to those who lie to us, Letho warned. Calm down, Letho. Let's change the topic. I heard witchers always have two swords with them. Why do you only have one? Letho's face stiffened. You should know that every school specializes in different fields. The Viper School specializes in short swords and poison for battle. Roy kept staring at him. Letho then shrugged, and Roy heard resignation in his voice. I think you know that witchers have a steel sword and a silver sword that can each be held with one hand. Yes, the steel sword is for humans, and the silver sword is for monsters who are weak to silver, right? Roy asked. Letho shook his head. That's too absolute. Some monsters are weak to silver, but steel works better on some of them. You know why I only have one steel sword? It's because even a silver-coated steel sword costs a lot, let alone a full one. The Viper School has seen better days, and now we must use our resources on more important matters, like your development. Roy's heart skipped a beat. I wonder if being watched over by a witcher is a good thing. I don't think I'd get a good steel sword anytime soon. Actually, I'm more interested in crossbows. Are you familiar with weapons like that, Letho? Can you teach me how to use it? Roy was disappointed, for he still hadn't gotten a ranged weapon skill after a month of hunting. Ranged weapons like bows and crossbows were more compatible with his strongest stat, perception, compared to melee weapons. After his level up, Roy had increased the level of his new skill, thus making observe a level 2 skill. He also had a two-point increase in perception. You're barking up the wrong tree, boy. Crossbows are the specialty of the cat school and bear school. Letho looked into the night, his gaze deepening as he walked down memory lane. I'm not exactly a master, but I've used crossbows at some point in my life, so I'll teach you in a couple of days. Letho then took out a bag of brown powder and made a circle on the ground with it, surrounding the horse, the campfire, him and Roy. Roy's nose wrinkled, and the stench of the powder reached him. Is that powder made out of some creature's feces? Not bad, boy. This is made out of a wyvern's feces. Surround yourself with it, and no wild animals will come near. Gives you a good night's sleep. Roy's nose scrunched up, though he could still take the smell. At least it was better than when he was the butcher's apprentice. When the cold breeze brushed against him, Roy shivered. Letho, can you not call me boy or brat? Just call me Roy. Being called brat made him feel like a little boy. Well, you'll have to work hard so that I'll acknowledge you. I might just call you by your name then. Letho didn't even look up. You'll have to get used to it from now on. Get closer to the fire if it's cold. Once Roy had huddled closer to the fire, Letho said, Now it's time for your first witcher lesson, boy. Less talking, more thinking. Never show your weakness to anyone. Not even the people closest to you. Shh! Letho suddenly put his index finger against his lips, demanding Roy to be silent. 
He obliged, though he listened closely to his surroundings. A wolf's howl reached them from afar, and pairs of ghastly green eyes appeared around the camp. Roy held his breath as he loaded his crossbow in silence. The eyes swayed in the air, and they stared at the campfire. But they didn't move closer, as if stopped by some invisible force. Letho drew the axii sign near his horse, calming the whining, disquieted animal down. The wolves only howled for a short while, and they didn't come near them. In the end, they returned to the darkness, whimpering in fear. Wyvern's feces do come in handy, Roy mumbled to himself. With Letho protecting him and the wyvern's feces keeping the beasts away, Roy could gain EXP quickly in the wilds if he used his advantages to the fullest. They were in a place where beasts were at least ten times more numerous than they were in the woods around Care. I can get a lot of EXP here. And I have some meat and anesthetic left. Look here, boy, Letho commanded, and Roy looked back reflexively. All he saw was an inverted triangle, and an overwhelming sleepiness assailed Roy. He closed his eyes and became oblivious to everything around him. Axie's effect lingered for a while, and Letho mumbled many things to the hypnotized boy. Roy thought he'd heard Letho say something, but the wind blew everything away. Then Letho heaved a sigh of relief and dispelled Axie. He cracked his fingers and massaged the boy who had fallen asleep. Letho gazed at the young boy, and his expression softened. When was the last time I took a disciple in? Thirty years ago? Shame that kid couldn't even get past the first round of the trial. Will this mysterious brat have better luck? Chapter 16. Hypnosis and Herbs Ash. As the first ray of light pierced through the darkness which was spread across the horizon, dawn broke through the sky. Mmm. Roy stretched his arms and opened his eyes. Every cell in his body felt relaxed, as if he'd just soaked in a hot spring. It was the first time he'd had a good night's sleep since he crossed over two months ago. The dawn breeze kissed him, and it took away his lethargy, making Roy feel refreshed. Oh, right. Why'd I... Axie. Damn it. Why'd he use Axie on me? The color drained from Roy's face, and he quickly checked himself. I'm fine. My clothes are intact, and I don't feel weird anywhere. He heaved a sigh of relief. Good thing Baldy isn't gay. You're awake, brat. As Letho said good morning in his iconic deadpan voice, some thigh meat grilled to golden brown flew across the air in an arc. Ow, ow, hot! Roy tossed the meat around clumsily before finally catching it. He blew on it and asked, What did you do to me last night? Look at your wound. Oh, it's all healed. Roy's thigh had been covered in blood since hours of horseback riding had gnawed his skin. It would have taken five days to heal, but the wound had formed scabs overnight. They were hideous, a dull reddish-brown hue, and were hard to the touch. But it didn't hurt. I hypnotized you with Axie last night and fed you some herbs. That's not a good idea, Letho. Shouldn't you tell me before you do that? Didn't think Axie helped with sleep, though. Wait, you couldn't have fed potions to me, could you? Potions for witchers could harm normal humans greatly, and Roy didn't want to hurt himself when he was still in his growing phase. He checked his character sheet, but everything seemed fine to him. His strength even grew by 0.1 point, making it 4.3. Whoa. I got stronger in a night than I could in a month. What kind of magic meds did he feed me? Won't be as effective if you have your guard up, Letho explained. Still a long way from the trial of the grasses, potions will kill you if you take them before the trial. Relax. You had special herbs made for humans. It can even make you stronger if you take them regularly. Roy's eyes shone at the mention of the effect. That kind of herb exists? He stopped complaining and gobbled up the remainder of the thigh. Nice cooking. He clicked his tongue in praise. Meat's tender enough and smells great. What's this made out of, Letho? Letho's eyelid twitched and he took a deep breath. Wolf, the same beast that tried to kill us last night. Letho didn't ask Roy to ride on horseback with him. Instead, he took the horse and sauntered in the wilderness. It was a land filled with strange plants and muddy ground that squelched under their feet, but the air was sweet, tangy, and humid. From time to time, roe deers, honey badgers, and deers would stick their heads out of the bushes just to turn tail and run in fright at the sight of them both. Where are we going? Letho was already used to Roy's incessant questioning, and he shrugged before giving a cryptic answer. Think closely, and you'll find the answer. 
Roy squinted skeptically, and a moment later, one long, strange message appeared in his mind. Marigold, biennial plant, has glandular trichomes. Its leaves are alternate and circular in shape. Its flowers can be yellow or orange, prefers cooler climates. It can survive the cold, but dies quickly in higher heat. Can help with digestion and healing of wounds. Buckthorn, annual plant, stem grows upright and has trichomes. Its leaves grow in a world arrangement, prefers warmer climates and places with sufficient light as well as air circulation. Can survive hot environments, but dies if there's too much water. Water. Can act as an antidote for poison and a medicine for plagues. Nettle, belladonna, comfrey, myrtle, chrysanthemum, berbercane fruit. The images, details, and medicinal value for more than 30 herbs appeared within his mind, and Roy memorized them without difficulty. He was sure he could recognize every sin, glee one of them, if they were to appear before him. You were almost healed when we left care. Time for you to learn new things. Letho still held the horse by the leash. So I used a sign last night to make you memorize the common herbs. They can do anything from stopping minor bleedings to neutralizing toxins. Remember them well. You'll have to use them eventually, he explained slowly. Roy had his question answered. Over the course of one night, Letho had bestowed multiple surprises upon him. Roy became stronger, and he had a compendium of herbs in his mind. He hadn't seen most of them before, and he was sure they never appeared in the game. That's normal, though. This is the real world. It's not as limited as the game. Of course, I don't know a lot of things. However, he had a giant head start with a witcher mentoring him. These witchers really know how to use signs to their fullest potential. Never thought Axie could be used to bestow knowledge. I thought that only happened in novels. Why didn't you leave more in my head, Letho? Something like alchemy? We can continue tonight. Letho was inscrutable. Sure, if you aren't scared of having a splitting headache for your whole life. He then stopped before an area filled with bush. Wherever Roy looked, there was green, but the plants also came in different shapes. Some thicker, some thinner, some bigger, some smaller. Now look for the herbs you saw in your head. Which one did you feed me last night? I want to pick more of them. Those are Berber cane fruits, Letho answered. Not a bad plant, to be honest. Take it every day, and it'll make you stronger. Before Roy went to harvest the herbs, Letho told him what he should look out for. If you go in to pick them, without knowing their structure and the parts that are important, you'll ruin the herb. Then, they won't even be worth one crown. Take Berber cane fruits, for example. The only valuable part is the red, misshapen fruits underground. The leaves that grow above it, however beautiful they are, aren't worth a thing. You can't just pull it out however you want, though. Plants are a type of life form, and they can protect themselves. If you pull on it too strongly, the leaves will secrete a kind of fluid that will destroy the fruit. You'll have to be careful with how you pull them out, Brad. If you're too soft, it won't work. If you're too strong, it'll be ruined. As Letho went on with his explanations, Roy slowly paid more attention to the specifics. He never realized there were so many details to look out for, and it was a mere plant. Around the bushes lay fallen leaves. They were covered in a sheet of sleet and dewdrops. The northern realms had always been colder than any other place. It was already late autumn when Roy arrived there, and snow had descended upon most nations. Roy's face was red from the cold, but still he went on with his harvest among the bushes, icy step by icy step. Fortunately for him, berbercane fruits weren't rare, and he found a bunch of them not long after his search had started. The difficult part, however, was the plucking. Roy had to pull the fruit out of the ground without shocking the leaves. If he made even one rough move, the green, juicy leaves would blacken completely in an instant, and the fruit would rot in a chain reaction. Roy was drenched in sweat at the end, but he managed to pluck a sizable amount of Berber cane fruits. They were gleaming under the sun, their crimson hue uncannily resembling strawberries, and the smell alone refreshed Roy. He placed most of them in his inventory and popped one into his mouth. Then a status that said, poisoned, mild, appeared on the right side of his HP bar. Weird, my HP and stats are normal, and I don't feel unwell. Why'd this status show up? If I could just find out more about the fruit. Roy fell into his thoughts for a while, and a stroke of inspiration struck him. 
He remembered about his level 2 observe skill. I made a mistake. I thought observe could only be used on humans, animals, and monsters. But can it be you, said on herbs too? Roy swiftly found a fresh berbercane plant, and he activated observe. His eyes turned into a galaxy of knowledge as an information sheet appeared on top of the plant. Berbercane, perennial plants. This particular plant is currently two and a half years old. Berbercanes can be found in the northern realms or lands that constantly experience temperatures lower than 20 degrees. Usages, one, can be eaten as food. Taking an ounce of berbercane fruit every day for a month will increase your stats gradually. It can raise your stats by one point at the maximum and the effect will stop after your stats reach five points. Number two, as material for potions and decoctions. Negative effects, contains mild poison. The user must wait until the poison has disappeared fully before consuming another fruit. If not, the poison will consume the user's sense of taste. If the poison remains for more than two months, the user will lose their sense of taste permanently. The user is immune to the poison if their stamina is higher than 15. The message detailed the age and dosage of the fruit. It was a perfect complement to the pointers Letho gave him. It was then that Roy prioritized the leveling up of Observe. After putting the rest of the Berbercane fruits in his inventory space, Roy started sweeping through the bushes for herbs. It took him the whole morning to get through the patch of bushes, but in the end, he found 12 types of herbs he saw in his mind, including myrtles, crow's eyes, beggar ticks, and black hellebore. Aside from Berbercane fruits, an herb called Blowball could give him a minor increase in strength, though only by one point at most. It wasn't too obvious an improvement. Even so, attribute points were hard to come by. He was only awarded one point with every level up, and at the time being, he needed 1,000 EXP to do so. Leveling up would eventually become a steep hill to climb, which made stat improvements through herbs a sweet bonus for him. If Roy's observe was correct, consuming blow balls and berbercane fruits for a month would raise his weakest stats, constitution and strength, to five points, making him on par with a normal adult. The only drawback was the fact that consuming herbs was a double-edged blade. It could strengthen him, but they could poison him too. If he wasn't careful, he would lose his sense of smell and taste. Fortunately, the poison effect wasn't permanent. On the contrary, it faded fast enough for Roy not to mind it. After finishing his berbercane fruit, he popped some blowball petals into his mouth and gave it a thorough chew in case it would upset his stomach. Raising my stats with herbs is the easiest way to train I've ever heard. Chapter 17, Drowner. It was almost dusk when Roy was done scavenging for herbs. The pair arrived at a murky river that was 10 feet wide, but which had both ends extend indefinitely. Letho stopped in his tracks, and his pupils turned into slits. As Roy observed him, he was reminded of a bristled feline, though in human form. PRN 10 feet is around 3.05 meters. What's wrong? Is this a dangerous place? Letho signaled for Roy's silence, and he crept closer to the river. He pulled out a blue scale from the cracks between the pebbles at the riverside. Once he took a whiff of it, Letho moved backward. We'll have to camp further away. Something nasty is in the river. You're saying, Roy gazed at the murky waters, and excitement welled up in him. There's at least one drowner in the waters. Letho tossed the scale to Roy. Take a look. Drowners are different from fish. Their scales are thicker, and there's a bulge in the center. And if you smell it carefully, there's the stench of rotten corpses on it. Roy tried to do so, but since his perception wasn't high enough, he couldn't smell anything. They stayed around for a moment, and when Roy left with Letho, his head hung low along the way. Suddenly, he patted Letho's sturdy back. Letho, can you show me what the legendary drowners look like? He asked hesitantly. Since I'm going to fight them eventually, this is a good time to learn all about them. Someone will get killed if we leave these monsters alone. Drowners have a nickname among us witchers, Letho snapped back. Newbie killers. Many new witchers have met their doom at the hands of drowners because of their damned curiosity. Roy took a nervous step back. Even though Letho had said he was going to leave, he'd saddled his horse before going back to search across the riverbank, and he found more scales. The witcher pondered for a moment, then he checked his gear, weapon, bombs, and potions. 
Roy was surprised to see Letho so serious, as if the drowner was a big threat. Is that necessary? I thought drowners weren't great at fighting. He'd killed many drowners in the game. At least hundreds of them died by Roy's hands. He could still remember their gurgles and strange nasal noises. His many battles gave him a thorough understanding of the monster. Their strength was on par with that of a normal human's, though their speed was better. Aside from being better swimmers, Roy didn't think they were memorable. Looks like those dreams of yours don't work every time. Letho poured some light green necrophage oil on his sword. Didn't your dream tell you something? Monsters don't come alone. Sometimes they come in groups. These bastards always come in groups, so keep that attitude in check, boy. Never underestimate any monster, no matter how weak they are. We only have one life, and no one will spare you any pity if you get killed because of your foolishness. That's the second lesson. Letho took out a bloodied wolf thigh from the saddlebag and tore it into pieces with his short sword. I understand. There will be no next time. Roy looked down in shame. Letho made him remember that he was still human, and drowners could kill humans easily. If he kept taking on his enemies in such a frivolous manner, he would eventually get killed because of it. I've been this way since the last adventure. That's not a good habit. Gotta change it right now. What should I do, Letho? How should I help? Roy took out his crossbow and loaded it with bolts. Just stay back and watch how a professional hunts. Letho paused for a moment. But if you want to help, then answer me this. What's a drowner's weakness? He stared at Roy, inscrutable. Roy wanted to say something, but he kept his mouth shut and listened intently. Letho nodded in satisfaction, so he finally knows the importance of humility. Remember, Drowners aren't afraid of poison. Don't try to make them bleed either. It won't work. Roy shivered after hearing Litho's advice. He was going to use the butcher's anesthetic against the drowner. If he'd done that, he might have grabbed. He'd been the first otherworlder in the history of novels to have been eaten by a drowner. Drowners aren't known for their intelligence. They're stupider than a boot, so Axie won't work on them either. And their sight is terrible. If their target is more than 40 feet away, they'd effectively be blind, even in daylight. Of course, you'll have to outrun them. They're scared of fire and anything related to it. Letho took out a transparent, left glass canister the size of half a fist from his alchemy bag. Roy could see multicolored gas swirling within it. That's Dragon's Dream, a kind of alchemy bomb. It's infused with flammable gas, Letho said. You're good with the crossbow, so I assume your accuracy is decent? Once I lure the drowners out, listen to my signal and toss the bomb to where they group up. Then I'll light the fuse. Understand? Yes, sir. Letho cut the bloodied meat up into dozens of pieces before scattering them on an even spot of ground, twenty feet from the river. Then he quickly came back to hide with Roy a safe distance away and stared at the river closely. Five minutes later, the river that had been flowing silently started bubbling as if it were boiling. Ripples spread as something crawled out of the murky depths. First there was one, then two, then three. Finally, five hideous humanoid creatures reared their heads from the river and gurgled as they darted to the riverbank. The monsters bore a resemblance to corpses fished out from the bottom of lakes. Their skin was blue or green in color, but all of them had sticky fluids and filthy mud dripping out of their pores. Their limbs were adorned with slippery scales, and webs like those of aquatic animals were seen between their fingers. Gills that looked like fans hung from their cheeks, and a catfish mustache wiggled above their lips. Their bodies were deathly pale, as well as their sunken faces. Two rows of sharp teeth glistened in their mouths as they grinned. The drowners were looking everywhere in paranoia, their eyes ghastly white. After they were certain that no one was around, the drowners sniffed the air, and they pounced at the minced meat with excitement. They had a strange way of running, with their hands behind their backs, just like ostriches would. Roy looked at Letho, but he didn't give any signal yet. Then Roy looked at the monster that had mutated the most, and his eyes turned into a galaxy of information. Drowner sex, none. Age 12. Status, none. HP 70 Strength, 5 Dexterity 6 Constitution 7 Perception, 3 Will, 2 Charisma, Zirit, Spirit, Skill, Underwater Breathing Level 10, Allows for Indefinite Periods of Breathing Underwater. Mutated Body Level 10, 
Many think of drowners as monsters that are formed from corpses of those who died a watery death, but their bodies are structured differently than humans. Drowners are possibly artificial life forms created by magic or an invasive species from the conjunction of the spheres, immune to poisoning and bleeding. They have zero charisma and spirit? Are you sure they aren't dead bodies? Roy commented silently. No wonder Axie has no effect on them. When he looked at Letho again, the Witcher had already given his signal. Roy took a deep breath and pulled his right hand back before tossing the bomb into the air. It flew in an arc and dropped in the middle of the five drowners. The bomb was smashed into pieces as it slammed into the ground, and the colorful smoke spread ten feet in every direction, enveloping the monsters that were feasting on the meat. At the same time, Letho darted forward like the wind and casted Igni at the drowners before pulling back. The fire that touched the colorful smoke spread across the monsters quickly, as if it had met something that could help it soar. Roy, crossbow in hand, watched the drowners in shock as fireworks rained upon them. The yellow flames gleamed within the colorful gas, and as the sound of explosions started ringing out, the sky was dyed in the colors of the smoke. Five gurgling charred drowners leaped out of the explosion, and three of them ran toward the river. Letho chased after them with his short sword in hand, intending to finish them off. The other two targeted Roy, but one was shot through the eye before it could get near him. When Roy was about to reload, the remaining drowner had already closed in on him. There wasn't even a millimeter of hair on its pale, grotesque face, and the flames were still igniting it. When the stench of its charred meat and bad breath assailed Roy, he felt suffocated. Roy could see death staring him in the eye, but it left as soon as it had appeared. The drowner who was attacking him froze in its tracks as if stopped by some magical force. Even so, the inertia made it skid forward, close enough so Roy could grab it. It was a weird situation, but there was no time for Roy to think about it. He took out his short sword and sliced down on its head, making it stumble backward. As the drowner fell, Roy shot a bolt through its eyes. The monster trembled, but stopped moving a moment later. Drowner killed. EXP gained. 20. Drowner killed. EXP gained. 20. Level 2. EXP 143-1000. Roy heaved a sigh of relief. Dizziness started overwhelming him, and his body was drenched in sweat. That was a close one. I was almost killed. If fear hadn't activated back then, I might have been killed by that drowner. Best case scenario, I would have gotten crippled. Know why we call them newbie killers now, boy? Letho had come back from his hunt. The three drowners hadn't managed to escape, and their heads were cut off. Still think you can underestimate them? Roy kept quiet. He didn't expect the cool witcher to be a nagging person. What should we do with these bodies? Should we throw them into the river, or burn them again? Take their brains out. I'll teach you what to do. Drowner brains are important to make swallow. Some sorcerers would buy it too. The witcher and his disciple went around the riverbank and laid the drowner's bodies out in a row. It'd be best if we could find a red mutagen. Dragon's dream costs a lot to make. If there's no red mutagen, we'd be losing money. Chapter 18. Meditation. Facing the mountain. The cold wind blew across the wilderness, making the cruel night ever so frigid. Two people sat around a warm, crackling fire as they munched on their dinner, a hot, steaming, grilled rabbit. Letho sipped from his est est and blurted out, I remember you asking for some pointers on using crossbows. I have some time to talk to you about that now. Roy was a self-taught crossbowman. He'd been wishing for some professional training. After starting his journey with Letho, Roy could feel Gabriel getting limited in its use. He could use it to kill normal animals, but not monsters. The only way to break the impasse was through an improvement of his skills. Letho asked him to take Gabriel out and talked about crossbows. Can't talk about Viper School's crossbow skills, since that's not our specialty. I'll tell you about the experience a friend from the cat school shared with me. You know people from the cat school, Letho? Roy asked curiously. If he remembered correctly, cat school witchers had problematic personalities after taking their special made decoction during the trial of the grasses. They would walk an extreme path, and being a witcher exacerbated that, for they were shown the darkness of the world. Left unchecked, they would spiral into madness. 
There were six known Witcher schools. Bear School, Wolf School, Griffin School, Cat School, Viper School, and Manticore School. Only Witchers from Cat School would accept assassination requests publicly. Because of that, the Cat School was rejected by the other schools in society, making them persona non grata everywhere. Cat School had a complex relationship with the Wolf School and was the only one accepting female disciples. PRN Definition of Persona Non Grata In diplomacy, a persona non grata, Latin, person not welcome, plural, personae non grata, is a status sometimes applied by a host country to foreign diplomats to remove their protection by diplomatic immunity from arrest and other normal kinds of prosecution. Also, I want to join the Cat School XD. Everyone says that the cats are madmen. Letho rubbed an old scar on his left forearm, and reminiscence showed in his amber eyes. But that's obviously nonsense. There are witchers from the cat school who can coexist with others in peace. But I digress. Let's talk business. Tell me what you think is most important when attacking with a crossbow. Roy fiddled with Gabriel and made an aiming pose. I aim, then I shoot. Oh, the most important part is the time I pull the trigger. It's the shooting isn't it? That's the deciding factor between hitting or missing the target. You're not a total idiot, boy. Yes, everything you do before you shoot is for that exact moment, the moment you pull the trigger. Letho circled the campfire and paused for a moment. The details can be complicated. There are five steps to follow if you want to shoot a crossbow. How you hold it, how you position yourself, how you load the bolts, how you aim, and how you shoot. Roy remained calm despite the complicated explanation. He was already ready for that, for he knew complex details were hidden behind every simple task, and they were only revealed when a professional searched for them. We have time, so take it slow. Let's start with the basics. Holding the crossbow. Hold it like how you always do. Roy was used to holding Gabriel with one hand since it was smaller than standard crossbows, but he could hold it with two as well. Roy followed the instructions and stood up straight, then holding the lower middle part of the crossbow with his left hand, he held the handle with his right. Letho started pushing down on Roy. You didn't learn from a master, did you? Your movements are all wrong, but it isn't too late to correct them. He told him the crux of the skill. Remember, you have to center your gravity and relax. Understood? Your shoulders have to be level and you're not supposed to support the crossbow with any part beside your hands. Since you're right-handed, you should point, tee your left elbow and tuck it in. Don't ask why you should correct your movement every time. You'll know why after your 10,000th shot, because the guy who told me this shot at least a million. PN casually notes this down. The movement sounded easy, and it was simple to follow, but it was hard to maintain at all times, at least enough for it to become second nature. Practice would be boring. Roy kept cheering himself up, though. Keep this up, Roy. This is the first step to gaining power. If I can't even take this, how am I supposed to pass the trial of the grasses? More than one hour of practice later, Roy was drenched in sweat, but he was starting to hold his crossbow the right way. Letho then went on to talk about how he should load the bolt. If you want to learn how to shoot, then preparation is key. First, learn how to hold the weapon and how to load it. Three hours had passed after Roy had learned how to do the second step. As the moon rose to its peak, Roy was starting to stagger from the exhaustion. According to Letho's way, he had to use his foot while loading the bolt. It took more out of Roy, but it was safer and more efficient compared to loading with hands. Roy didn't complain throughout the session. Even though he was already drenched in sweat, he was focused on his training. Letho was happy with his attitude, and he thought Roy might just have a chance to pass the trial. That's it for tonight. When Roy was drying his clothes by the campfire after he had washed himself off, Letho said, It's almost time to sleep. Since you asked, now you have two choices. One, I'll use Axie to hypnotize you. You'll fall into a deep sleep which will help you recover from your fatigue quickly. Maybe you'll even get something out of it. Two, you try to recover on your own. Roy recalled the good sleep he'd had last night. Are you trying to sneak more knowledge into my mind, Letho? He queried. I said that's going to give you a permanent headache. Letho rubbed his fingers together. If you're fine with the first way, then relax and don't resist, 
or it won't work as well as it's supposed to. Roy gave it a moment of thought. If Letho wants to harm me, I'd be killed before I could make a move. Telling me before using Axii is already a sign of respect. He let go of any misgivings and quickly fell into a deep sleep. It was a peaceful week after that night. No monsters came to attack them, nor did they come across any creature. During the journey, the Witcher would scavenge for herbs in the wilderness during daytime to teach Roy about them. When dusk would fall, Roy would go for a hunt with his new and improved crossbow skills. That granted him some EXP and dinner. Once night had fully fallen, Roy would practice around the campfire, and Letho would be the coach. After buckets and buckets of sweat, Roy was finally starting to get into the important part, the breathing technique. He could feel his shooting skill improve, but it didn't develop into a skill he could use. He needed real battles for that. Before he slept, Letho would use Axie on him to induce a deep slumber. Every morning, Roy woke up refreshed and reborn. One week after that, Roy's EXP bar was already at 280 points. His constitution was raised by 0.1 points thanks to the herbs he was consuming, bringing it to 4.4. His strength saw the same increase, bringing it to 4.3. At the time being, Roy could memorize more than 50 types of herbs, their effects, where they grew, and how to handle them. Massacre could affect five more types of animals. Roy was starting to enjoy the slow but sure process of growth. Then, the night came, when they finally got out of the remote wilderness. They could see a tall, sturdy wall over yonder. The windows of tall spires behind the wall glimmered, and white smoke billowed from the top. That's Aldersburg, the city neighboring the Mahakam mountain range and southern Adern's last line of defense. We'll be there by tomorrow. Roy looked in the direction of the wall, and he saw a gigantic mountain range standing beh, in it, looming over them. From where he stood, the mountains looked like an ancient monster, deep in its slumber. The infinite snow and the dappled greenery was little more than ornaments for the mountain. That was the Mahakam mountain range. It was the giant that separated Tamiria and Adern, the home of dwarves. Rumors had it that gnomes lived there too. They would have to go through Aldersburg and scale past the mountains before they could arrive in Sintra. But since it was getting late, the pair camped in the wilds. After another satisfying grilled meat dinner, Letho sat quietly on the ground, facing the Mahakam mountain range. The depressing silence he'd kept along the way faded, replaced by a grounded, peaceful strength. As Roy stared at Letho's back, the magical energy the Witcher radiated made him feel at ease. Letho said, Meditation was created by the first sources. It's a way to communicate and control chaos energy, or elemental energy, so to speak. It is then left as inheritance for the Witchers by Cosimo Malaspina, the founder of Witchers. Meditation can calm humans and Witchers alike. It can also cleanse negative emotions, heal bodily wounds quickly, speed up recovery, and induce deep sleep. But those who are sensitive to magical energy can sense the elemental energy through meditation. They can harness the power from air, water, earth, and fire. If they aren't sent to a sorcerer's academy to tame the elemental energy they channel during their meditation, slash, they have after they exit meditation, they will be driven mad after their powers get out of control. Worse, their bodies will twist and mutate. That's why I'll need you to go into meditation, boy. I need you to tell me if you're a normal human or a magic-sensitive one. Roy's heart skipped a beat, so this is it. Then he was confused. What should I do to enter meditation? He was sure Letho had never mentioned anything regarding meditation before that night. If it was possible, Roy wished he was a magic-sensitive human. Witchers were derivatives of mages, making them less powerful than one. However, he saw nothing regarding magic, elements, or chaos energy in his character sheet. There weren't any skills or mana in there either, and Roy knew he might not be a mage then. Letho answered his question calmly. I hypnotized you with Axie every night before you slept. That wasn't for deep sleep. I did say you might get something out of it, and you took my offer, Letho emphasized. To be more precise, you have entered meditation six times, so you're ready for it. Your body has adapted to the process, but since you didn't enter it yourself, you didn't remember it. Tonight, you'll have to do it yourself and tell me what you feel during meditation. I can get something out of it. I thought that was weird, so this is why. 
Does he trust me enough now to tell me about it? Roy was glad he made the choice to be hypnotized, but he remembered nothing about meditating. All he knew was he slept well every night. Don't think too much about it. Sit like I'm sitting. Roy followed his instructions and made a weird sign with his fingers, but it felt natural to him, as if he had done it many times. Roy entered a bizarre state a moment later. He felt warm and fuzzy, prof as if he was in his mother's womb again. Every cell on his body was roaring as they absorbed everything around them to heal and strengthen themselves. The blowing winds and crackling campfire looked ever so distant, and he stared at the Maacham mountain range, Aldersburg disappearing from his sight. The clouds that swirled above it moved in a random manner, but eventually they formed a spiral that sucked him in. Chapter 19 Massacre Air, water, earth, and fire swirled around you, and they left? As expected, you're a normal human. A normal human. The message rang around him, and Roy sighed. I knew it. I'm a peasant son after all. That's what I should be. I wasn't sent to a witcher because of any accident, nor am I part elf, and I'm not a magic-sensitive person. The only way I can stand tall in this world is through hard work. That moment steeled his resolve to become a witcher. After going into meditation for the first time, a message popped up in his character sheet. You have unlocked a new skill, Meditation Level 1. Meditation is training for the body and mind. Going into a meditative state calms the body and soul, speeds up the recovery of wounds, mana, and stamina, improves coordination, and increases affinity for chaos energy. Tip hip. Every time meditation is leveled up, constitution and spirit will be permanently increased. Roy's jaw dropped. It was the first time he'd acquired a skill that could increase his stats. His interest was piqued, and he wanted to level up immediately so he could level up the skill. But he calmed down quickly and set the idea aside. He couldn't cast signs before unlocking mana, so increasing spirit wouldn't do much since it only added to the strength of spells. Letho was observing him in silence. He could sense some unseen changes in Roy through his extraordinary perception. But he couldn't describe it in detail. He's one mysterious boy, but he belongs to the Viper School now. His secret shall be ours, and it will pave the way for our return. The pair left the wilds the next morning, and they went down the path leading toward Aldersburg. The path was strewn with carriage tracks and hoof prints, while a dense forest flanked it. Dappled sunlight shone through it, and the leaves rustled as the morning breeze blew past them. The fresh scent of the earth and leaves were swept up into the air, wafting across the path. As the wind grew stronger, Letho pulled on the leash, forcing the horse to stop. As if alerted by something, he hunkered down and drew across the tracks before looking ahead, but there was nothing to see. Then alarm bells rang in his head. Crossbow at the ready, Roy. Prepare for battle. Damn it. Why'd trouble have to show up at the last leg? Roy held down on the crossbow string made out of a cow's tendons and loaded his bolts. He wasn't worried despite Letho's warning. Perhaps his confidence came from his meditation, or maybe from Letho. As they walked along the path, Roy listened closely to his surroundings, and his muscles turned taut. Two hundred feet later, Letho stopped again, the black cloth on his shoulder billowing in the gale. A shrill sound of a whistle traveled across the forest, and a group of pasty men in tattered clothes rushed out of the forest. Are they peasants, or a hodgepodge army? Their clothes were nothing but ugly rags, and they were equipped with nothing but farming implements, hoes, hammers, and even pitchforks. They were in a loose, random formation, and they spat curses at the pair. They surrounded them closely, their faces filled with a cruel hunger. Then, a middle-aged man with a green leather hat, yellow jacket, and black pants came forward. He had a mole on his face. The group gave way to him, and he strutted with his chest out, as if he were a rooster. Put your weapons down, and get down on the ground, he commanded. Roy held his crossbow like he practiced, and he counted their enemies. There were thirteen of them. Letho crossed his arms dismissively, ignoring the peasant's warning. Rebel army, huh? So you're becoming bandits now? Roy thought quietly. Rebel army? Aren't they revolutionists? He had heard about the peasant movement in Aldersburg when he was still in care. These guys are revolutionists? They're just bandits. Fuck you. Did you just call us bandits, ye slandering bastard? The leader roared in indignance, his face red. 
We're doing this for the great revolution, to topple the tyranny of Demavend and Tavik. This is Jew, Stice. If you're on the side of justice, then put your weapons down and give up all your money for the revolution. If you try to resist, then you're the dogs of tyrants, and we shall judge you. Roy's face twitched. He had never seen someone so shameless before. Did they just twist a robbery into an act of justice? And we're the bad guys because we defend ourselves? Well, what can you expect from the West? No dignity. A frown creased Letho's forehead. Ever since he'd started running around, nobody had ever tried to rob a witcher. It was a rare occurrence. If this were in the past, he would have gone up there to kill the peasants, but since Roy was with him, he found it inappropriate to kill right away. Letho held the trinket around his neck and showed it to the peasants. Do you recognize this? Greed gleamed in the leader's eyes. Is that made out of silver? Toss him here, right now. Be boss, that's a witcher! A peasant with a long chin stammered, pointing at Letho, his face filled with horror. What? He's a disgusting mutant. Look at his eyes. Tis amber, the eyes of a cat. The peasants took a step back after hearing that. Roy's eyelid twitched, for he didn't expect witchers to be so feared. Boss. Witchers can kill monsters. We ain't no match for him. Another peasant stuttered out. What you so afraid of? The peasant leader bellowed when his men showed cowardice. They're just one witcher and a child. We outnumber them. The leader took two steps back and commanded, Charge, men. They can't fight us all at once. Shred them to bits. Yeah, we have nothing to be afraid of. Finding their courage once more, the peasants picked up their farming implements and pointed them at the pair, but none made the first move. One last time. Put your weapons down. And let you do whatever you want? Letho's face fell and he shook his head. Roy, noticing the imminent melee, went behind Letho. He wasn't a witcher, so he needed Letho to stay in front to keep him safe. I can practically smell the blood on you. Been doing this robbery business for a while now, haven't you? Killed a lot too by the looks of it, Letho replied dreely and mercilessly. God damn it, these bastards are resisting. Face your fate. The leader was still trying to justify his actions. The revolution demands sacrifice. Letho spent not another second in this debate. Before anyone could do anything, he'd already drawn a sign with his right hand. Then a red, triangular light shot itself into the leader's eyes. A moment later, a scream of horror pierced through everyone, and another peasant clutched his stomach as he staggered backward in disbelief. Standing before him was the peasant in the green leather hat, their arrogant leader. His eyes were dim, and he was holding a bloody sword, moving like a puppet. The Witcher controlled the boss, someone screamed. The boss killed Neil. As the peasants wallowed in their shock, Letho slowly unsheathed his steel sword instead of his short swords. The broad blade glinted coldly under the sun, and the Witcher poised himself before rushing into the band of peasants. He was like a tiger jumping into a group of sheep. Letho was superior in every way, strength, reflexes, battle skills, experience. The peasants were no match for him and Letho became a killing machine. Wherever he went, screams and wails of terror followed. Chunks of meat and broken limbs flew everywhere, and crimson blood dyed the ground red. Roy could see nothing but brilliant scarlet. As the sword swung along the cramped forest path, another scream was cut short, and Letho took another life away. The frightened peasants tried to scamper away, but they couldn't outrun a viper school witcher. Soon, the forest was filled with nothing but cries for mercy. Roy froze up. He'd killed many creatures, but most of them were just animals. He'd never killed humans. But right before his very eyes, a group of humans were slaughtered before they could even resist. No matter how much the peasants cried for mercy, Letho showed them none. All he did was swim. Jih his sword, again and again, as if he was the Grim Reaper. He moved instinctively, not deigning to use his potions or signs. Is this really the same guy who taught me herbology and crossbow skills? Is he really the same guy who hypnotized me every night so he could teach me meditation? Maybe this is how witchers work. They can kill both monsters and humans. Roy held his crossbow and took a deep breath. He parted his legs and lifted his arms, standing in the shooting pose he'd practiced many times. One survivor managed to escape Letho's massacre, but his face was bloodied. Even so, he looked hopeful, albeit crazed, as he ran toward Roy. Capture him! Capture that boy! 
We can use him to blackmail the Witcher. That's the only way to live. He was already wobbling, but he did his best to stay on his feet, and he extended his trembling hand forward in an attempt to hold the boy by his neck. Just a couple of steps away, and he's mine. A bolt arced through the air, hitting the peasant square in the face. The peasant stumbled backward, looking up into the sky, and fell down with a thud, spread-eagled. Between his widened eyes lay a crossbow bolt that pierced through his skull. XP gained, 20. Level 2, 301,000. Roy heaved a sigh and took another deep breath before reloading his crossbow and aiming in another direction. The bloody massacre ended ten minutes later. Letho took out a blue cloth and wiped the blood off his sword. Roy sat beside him, inscrutable. His hair and clothes were drenched in blood. A long while later, Roy took a deep breath. Now do you see how low these lands have fallen? There is no right or wrong here, Letho said coolly. If we didn't kill them all, trouble would have been waiting for us if any of them had managed to return to Aldersburg. Letho sighed after seeing Roy was still stunned. I can smell blood on them. These peasants are no decent human beings. This is not the first time they've done this, and this is not the first time they've tried or killed someone. Does that make you feel better? I'm fine, just not used to it, Roy answered. He showed no pity to those men. They didn't show mercy to their victims. Good, Letho praised. Also, you shot decently. Shows you actually listened to me. Roy killed three injured peasants. He breathed according to the tempo he was taught, and the moment he was going to breathe heavier, Roy pulled the trigger. His shots were true, and every single one of them was a killing blow. He could have killed more, but he'd hesitated. It was Roy's first time killing humans. He couldn't be as calm as Letho. One life was worth 20 XP, the same as a drowner. Roy's EXP was 341,000 after killing three humans. This is ridiculous. So lives are the same for the character sheet? They're just numbers and data? A short while after the massacre, the pair moved the peasants' bodies into a big hole in the forest. Letho then poured some oil on them and lit them up with Igni. It didn't take long for the bodies to char. That was done to prevent any plagues from spreading in case any ghouls were attracted. Letho took all the money the bandits robbed, which totaled a hundred crowns. Roy gained a lot of EXP and money in the kill, but he wouldn't wish for another occurrence like that. You can get half of the spoils, including the drowner's brain. To Roy's surprise, Letho gave him 50 crowns. Lesson 3. Always share the spoils, Letho told him solemnly. If you don't want to antagonize your partners after becoming a witcher, never let greed blind you. Roy was about to refuse. He had a bad feeling about the split, for he thought Letho was trying to tell him something else. Chapter 20. Aldersburg the Great Wall that stood thirty feet tall formed Adern's final line of defense, the city of Aldersburg. Lyria and Rivia stood in the east of the city, while the Mahakam mountain range stood in the west, stopping anyone from attacking. Aldersburg was almost impregnable, an iron wall between the Nilfgaardian army and their conquest. In front of the city was a moat dug by the people, and the bridge above it was the city's entrance, but it was heavily guarded. All kinds of people traveled across the bridge, farmers who were in a hurry to get to the market, merchants who brought carriages of merchandise, and even travelers from afar. They were forming a line for the guards to perform a check before they could get any clearance. Behind them, a great wilderness unfolded, where dozens of villages that provided for Aldersburg stood. Letho, a witcher from the Viper School? A guard asked. Yes. You'd better keep your head down when you're in there. The rebel army's troubling enough, and we don't want any more problems from a witcher. Understood? A guard with a halberd gazed at Letho with suspicion. His gleaming armor had a crest made up of red and yellow lines emblazoned on his chest. The crest that looked like a flaming arrow was Edirn's crest. After checking Letho's pass, the guard looked at the scrawny boy behind him. Is this boy with you? Yes. Who is he? My employer, Roy. He comes from Care. Lower Posada, wants to visit his family in Aldersburg. All right, you may go. Roy's delicate face and frail demeanor didn't make him look like a threat. The guards let them go without any further questions. The village boy, Roy, finally arrived in Aldersburg, a big city in another world. Even though a revolution was heating up, it didn't change the fact that it was a bustling city. 
Behind the city gates laid a buzzing business district. Shouts from store owners rang across the place, and different stores unfurled before their eyes. The district was filled with people dealing with their everyday business. Even the smallest house in the city was bigger and better than Care's village chief's house. Most of them had arched doors, etched windows, and domed roofs. The walls were filled with complex, ever-changing engravings as beautiful as pieces of art. Roy, who was used to the quiet wilderness, fell into a trance. He felt like he was in a European city during the late Renaissance, a shame Aldersburg was invaded during the First Northern War. I wonder how much of their culture can be preserved. Letho shook his head in mild disappointment, thinking Roy was shocked by the bustling city. After getting through the street that was behind the gates, the pair came to a clearing. Standing in the middle of the stone-paved street was a small fountain plaza. A seven-feet statue stood in the middle of the stone pedestal. The statue was that of an old man. He was in rags, but he had a wise twinkle in his eyes and a bushy beard. A crowd surrounded it, talking loudly. They had books in hand, and Roy guessed they must have been talking about academic topics. They were in better garments than the peasants, and they had hats on top of their heads. Trinkets hung on them, and even their shoes were neatly cleaned. A team of fully equipped soldiers patrolled nearby. Who's that statue supposed to be? Lebiota. He symbolizes wisdom. Has a lot of followers in Aldersburg. Letho answered indifferently. Those people there are merchants and children of minor nobles. The real workers are working their butts off to put food on the table. Roy went through his memories about Lebiota. He'd started out as a wandering public speaker who'd promoted his philosophy and wisdom everywhere. Thanks to his charisma and eloquence, he gained countless followers who believed his philosophy fervently. He was famous in the northern kingdoms, and humans weren't the only people who looked up to him. Dwarves did too. Eventually, he was called a saint, a seer, and a prophet. Many years after his death, he was worshipped as a deity in this, his temple. The mention of religion made Roy think of an infamous church. Isn't Eternal Fire the most popular religion in the north? Letho explained patiently. Eternal Fire is famous in Vizima, the capital of Temeria, and Novigrad, the city of freedom. In recent years, Eternal Fire has shown disdain toward non-human races, becoming more extreme with time. They have many followers, but are also infamous amongst many humans, dwarves, elves, and other non-human races. Roy knew that after Radovid's succession of the throne, the whole of Redania would be engulfed by Eternal Fire's flame. The cult eventually spread its bigotry further, encroaching witchers and mages. Everyone who wasn't human was hunted down, but that was a story for another time. Aldersburg is just beside the Mahakam mountain range, and that's where the dwarves live. They make business selling ores from the mountain, and that makes them a big power player here. They won't let Eternal Fire establish itself around their home. Not bad, Roy mumbled. Where are we going next? We've been on the road for a week. Let's rest up for a few days and see what happens. Walls Inn, Aldersburg City Center. Letho let himself go and ordered all sorts of wine, including dwarven liquor, Kirsch, and Fiorano. Wine filled the table, but all Letho did was taste them slowly. After every sip, he would squint in relaxation and take a deep breath, as if he were enjoying the best thing in the world. He would open his eyes from time to time to look at the merry crowd in the inn. Labor workers, farmers, merchants, and even thugs were having fun in the inn. Status was of no importance here. As for Roy, well, he found himself itching for something once he'd come inside. He was itching for Gwent. The boy took out the skellige deck Jack gave him, and went to a table that was having a loud Gwent match. He was brave enough to do that because of Letho being around. Let's switch once you lose, my friend. Get lost, you brat. A man in a shawl glared at Roy in disdain, but once Roy showed his deck, it attracted all the players' eyes. They looked at Roy with passion and greed, as if they could win his deck. Roy sat on the chair and smiled. Do you want to win my rare cards? He asked, inviting them into his trap. I will give them all if you win. Here's the deck, so come on up. Roy was planning to win more money with Gwent. City life was expensive. I can win with my deck as well as my XP. I mean my cheats, he mumbled. On the other hand, after having 20 glasses of wine, Letho was turning scarlet. 
Even though he was a witcher, having too many drinks made his mind foggy, though nobody knew if he was truly drunk. Not even himself. Most people would give a wide berth if they saw someone with a sword and amber eyes. Some gave witchers looks of disdain, but none harassed them. Letho was too fearsome a person, and everyone thought he could kill at a moment's notice. Not everyone was a bandit, and not everyone had the guts to provoke witchers. All but one kind of person. A woman walked toward Letho seductively, and she held his arms as if they'd known each other forever, though it was only mere moments since they'd met. She then whispered something into his ear. Boy! Letho shouted at the crowd. When Roy looked back in shock, Letho grinned toothily. Can you stay down here for a while? Roy couldn't object to that. He nodded in resignation and saw them off. Letho and the woman went upstairs, leaning against each other. That woman's taste is interesting, so she's interested in burly baldies. No, wait. She probably smelled the scent of crowns on him. He can't even hold back when his disciples hear. But then Roy thought about it, and he could understand it. They'd killed drowners and a dozen humans over a single week. Stress was inevitable, and release was important. Roy chose Gwent as an outlet, while Letho went for alcohol and women. Their interests were different, but their goal was the same.